Good morning to everyone. Today is such a wonderful Saturday of learning for us educators. Welcome to our webinar entitled Understanding Formative Assessment Remotely Insights into DepEd Order 31 Series of 2020. This is a free webinar sponsored by the BSDA Training Center, an accredited CBD provider by the Professional Regulation Commission. We have participants joining us via Zoom, and we are also live right now on the YouTube channel, Teachers Live by BSDA. Today's webinar will describe the principles that explain both the theory and practice in the conduct of formative assessment, as well as its important features when done in a remote de delivery mode. Insights into DepEd Order 31 series of 2020 will also be discussed in this webinar. Specifically, this webinar aims for the participants to integrate formative assessment in the print or online modules, conduct formative assessment across the MELCs for mastery, and utilize formative assessment effectively to prepare learners for summative assessment. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let us get to know our resource person for this webinar. Dr. Carlo Magno is a board member of the Philippine Educational Me Measurement and Evaluation Association. He is the founder of the Center for Learning and Assessment Development Asia. His specialized area is on measurement, evaluation, and analysis of test data, particularly that of item response theory. He was trained in structural equations modeling in Freie Universität in Berlin, Germany. He has constructed several standardized measures, scales, and tests for various purposes in the educational context. He received numerous awards in line with his research work, such as the outstanding scientific paper in social science in 2008 by the National Academy of Science and Technology Honorary Regional Advisor of Time Taylor International, CMAO Eurotech Research Fellow, and the 2011 Outstanding Young Scientist in the Republic of the Philippines. He is one of the 200 renowned global scientists given recognition by the Global Science Academy. He published over 110 publications in scientific, refereed, and abstracted journals. He is Presently, the top 91 highly cited scientists in the country reported by Google Scholar through Webometrics across 500 Filipino scientists. In education, he received recognition for excellence in teaching such as Student's Choice Award by the College of Education and DLSU, 2011 Lasallian Excellence Award Student Search for Outstanding Teacher, Best Junior Faculty in Psychology. He was commissioned by the DepEd in 2011 in writing the report for policy recommendations for the K-12 and the 2014 assessment framework, learning and development system, principals tests, and the superintendent's leadership program in 2018. He is part of the Commission on Higher Education's Technical Working Group on developing the framework and policy for flexible learning deliveries. He was recently commissioned by the Network on Education Quality Monitoring in the Asia and Pacific by the UNESCO to review the impact of, of disasters and calamities on the status of high stakes testing in Southeast Asia. Dr. Magno has conducted several seminars, workshops, and lectures on educational development in teaching, learning, and assessment around Southeast Asia, Middle East, and the Pacific. He is also a consultant to various Ministry of Education in developing countries in the Pacific like Palau, Micronesia, Marshall Islands, and Samoa. He served as a consultant in various sectors such as the Department of Education, National Council of Indigenous People, and other private institutions like De La Salle College of St. Benilde, Xavier School, Far Eastern University, Malayan Colleges Laguna and Mindanao, Mapu University, University of Bohol, Biliran Province State University, 
and Asian Institute of Management. Without further ado, fellow educators, let us welcome Dr. Carlo Magno. Let us give him a virtual round of applause. Good morning, everybody. I hope that you can um, hear me clearly. Okay, so in this particular session, we're going to um, talk about how we actually conduct formative assessment within a flexible learning delivery at different teaching modes. And um, we'll try to look at how principles on formative assessment actually supports some of the important principles and points indicated on our guidelines on grading and assessment indicated on DEPED order number 31. And in this um, particular session, I think the objectives are already um, provided. As we go along into our session, there are actually um, assigned um, volunteers to um, interact with me as we go on into some of the slides. Uh, may I request um, for me to um, share my screen so that I can um, show the slides? Okay. Okay, so how do we actually conduct formative assessment remotely? I think um, we all know that um, given the guidelines on how we conduct assessment in DEPED order number eight, that inside the classroom setting, we need to do both formative and summative assessment. There isn't much change on how we actually conduct formative and summative assessment, even in the light of the pandemic, when the teaching and learning modalities actually change into a variety of ways. We still are able to conduct both formative and summative assessment. The only changes are in terms of the platform that we use and how we actually mark and collect the results. In fact, um, given some of the challenges in our flexible learning delivery modes, there are some benefits and some easy ways on how we can actually conduct formative assessment. However, there are actually some challenges on how we conduct our summative assessment. Um, before we actually um, begin, I'd like to um, call out now the assigned two volunteers to go through this um, first activity that um, we have. First is I want some of the participants to ask me a question on what they want to know about formative assessment as a primer. All right. Um, I think our host is um, BSDA training. Okay. So, um, yeah. So what are some of the things that um, you're still confused about in terms of formative assessment? And we'll try to clarify them first. We'll ask um, two volunteers. Okay. So who is our host? <clears throat> Okay, Sir Denmark, can we now call our first volunteer? Um, thank you so much, Sir Dr. Magno. May we call on Sir Ponzi Anthony? Are you here? Yeah, I think um, Sir Ponzi is here. Sir Ponzi, can you please um, unmute? Hello, good okay, morning. Yeah. Yes, um, Sir, Sir Ponzi. Yes, so in the first um, exercise, uh, you'll have to raise your question and then um, we'll have another set of exercises again afterwards on the succeeding slides, okay? So just hang on. And when we call you, please be alert to turn on your microphone, okay? Yes. Okay, to get, can you uh, please um, give me a question that you want to be clarified about formative assessment? Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Sir Zian Reynelval from the Division of Venezuela. Um, okay. And I would like to raise this question. If there is a new um, standards that we can use for the formative and summative assessment. Okay, now um, standards. When you talk about Sir Ponzi standards, are you referring to standards of learning, which is actually the MELC, or standards in practice in conducting summative assessment? Because these are two different things. Yeah, can you clarify? As for today's um, time of pandemic, I would like to know if how are we going to use the assessment of formative and summative assessment. The okay, formative so and summative which, assessment. 
Okay, yeah. So which standards are you referring to a while ago in your first question? How are we going to use it in our curriculum for the MELT? Ah, okay. So basically, how we use formative assessment as indicated in DepEd Order Number 8 is the same on how you use it for your flexible learning modalities for this school year. Um, you all know that um, formative assessment is the one that we provide before the students are given the summative assessment. Because your purpose for the formative assessment is to collect information, but this time, these information that we collect are aligned with the MELC. So whatever you teach in the MELC, that's the kind of assessment that we need to conduct in your formative. And these formative assessments should be several so that you use this information, you use this result, number one, to make improvements in your teaching. Example, if you found out from your first formative assessment and your second formative assessment, like your exercises and drills, for example, in mathematics, that the students are not progressing. If the students are not progressing from the first exercise to the second exercise, then that's the time that we need to rethink about on how we do another round of reteaching. If you are implementing an online lesson, it's easy to do additional reteaching by coming up with another set of learning module. Example, you may record yourself teaching that particular learning competency and send that one in the Google Classroom or in the Facebook of your students or whatever learning management system that you're using. And if you, are, if you have prepared a print module, therefore, you need to produce another set of teaching and learning experiences and activities for that particular learning competency to your learners and send that to your students. So these are ways on how results of formative assessment actually goes on into our instruction. So whatever findings that we are able to see in our formative assessment, that is translated into specific actions to make improvement in our instruction. Because in the end, what we want is that our students will master these MELCs. Sir Ponce, is that clear now? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Okay, sir, so then Mark, can we ask the second uh, volunteer? Um, Dr. Magna, we have Mark, Mr. Mark Valdeviesco. Okay. Uh, sir Mark. Are you there, Mr. Mark? Yes, can you unmute oh. yourself? Okay, yeah. Sir Mark? Hello, sir. Okay, yeah, hello, Sir Mark. Sir Mark, um, please be on alert because later on I will be calling you again, okay, for another round of exercise. All right, so give me now your question that needs to be clarified in terms of formative assessment. Actually, sir, uh, as of this moment, um, I'm quite thinking about the removal of the... Quarterly. Quarterly examination. Mm -hmm. Basically, mm -hmm. we teachers, we are more focused on this type of... Uh, assessment because we foresee it as a summative one. So yes. knowing the fact that we have written works and then we have the performance, that's performance. Our, as, as our uh, basis for assessment. So how can we make use this more further as part of our uh, summative assessment, uh, neglecting the, the use of quarterly, assess, uh, quarterly test, uh, knowing the fact that we are now facing the pandemic and then we do not have a uh, means to provide this kind of examination to our students. Okay, I think um, what you're experiencing is um, a separation anxiety with the concept of quarterly assessment. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned in the first part of your um, question that you have been focusing on your quarterly assessment. Now take note that your quarterly assessment in the previous guideline is only 20% of your student's grade. Mm -hmm. Therefore, a larger part is devoted on your written and performance. If the larger part is devoted for your summative, for the written and performance, therefore, the focus and much of your preparation for on student learning should be devoted on these larger parts rather than on the quarterly assessment. Now take note that whatever you conduct and assess in your summative written and performance are also the ones that you assess in your quarterly assessment. The only difference is that your summative assessments are positioned and integrated 
after every teaching of the learning competency that is spread out within the quarter. And then when you put all of these together towards the end of the quarter in a table specification, that is now the coverage of your quarterly assessment. So the number one case here is that whatever you cover in the summative written and performance is the same as what you cover in the quarterly assessment. So there's actually not much different. Now, if you take out the quarterly assessment and put it as part of your summative written and performance, you're basically assessing the same learning competencies, right? So therefore, when you start assessing written and performance, you are basically assessing what you also need to assess in your quarterly assessment. Or put it in this way, if this is your quarterly assessment towards the end, it's just a matter of breaking apart those items in your quarterly assessment and distributing those sets of assessment protocols or items or tasks across the quarter. So rather than your quarterly assessment being given toward the end, you're now scattering those assessment across the quarter. And I think um, you're also able to provide a better view of student learning if you scatter it within the quarter. Why? Because when you conduct your assess summative assessment after every teaching of a MELC, you can focus on how well the students are able to attain specific learning competencies because they are now disaggregated as compared to bulking them together towards the end of the quarter. Okay, now, if you will be looking at debit order number 31 as well, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will not have any final or culminating assessment towards the end. It indicated there that even if we have taken out um, the quarterly assessment, you can still provide culminating assessment towards the end of the quarter. Yeah. I hope that clarified something in terms of your perspective, Sir Mark. Thank you, sir. All right. So, uh, yeah. So, um, we'll limit this time to um, two questions unless there's someone from the audience now in here in Zoom who wants to ask something. Go ahead now. I'm giving you five seconds before we go into a... Uh, if you want to, ha if you have questions that needs to be clarified, go ahead now. We'll have one more. Going once, twice, all right, so uh, yeah. So we proceed now with our presentation. Okay, so the objective for our particular session is actually indicated a while ago. And in this particular session, okay, we review again, what is the purpose of conducting formative assessment? I think, um, the first um, volunteer who asked that question was already clarified. And um, also the first question was also clarified in terms of how formative assessment is conducted. If we look at our debit order number 31 that was released um, last October um, 2, it provided us with important principles on how we actually conduct assessment and grading, okay? Um, first, it tells us that um, Assessment should be holistic and authentic. So when you say authentic, we assess on functional skills on what our students are actually doing in a real life setting. That is what we mean when you say authentic assessment. Therefore, if we want to assess communication skills among our students, we want to assess how well they communicate with another person we assess how well they write an email, they compose a sentence, they compose a text message, for example. Okay, so these are authentic platforms because they're done in a real life setting. This is what we mean when we say authentic assessment. Second one is that assessment is an important part of understanding student learning and development. Like what we have emphasized on um, formative assessment in the first um, question, we use the results of formative assessment to determine if our students are progressing towards the MELC. And if the students are not progressing towards the MELC, then we find ways on how we can provide further intervention in the delivery of our online or print modules in order to help our students attain that particular MELC that we are teaching. Then, 
The third important principle indicated is that we need to make use of a variety of assessment strategies, such as formative assessment, summative assessment, there are varieties of written works and performance-based tasks. Because every MELC would require a particular and appropriate form of assessment. Take note that one of the important principles in assessment is that every time that we conduct an assessment, it should be aligned with our MELC. If the MELC indicates that the students will solve word problems, therefore, the kind of assessment that we provide both in the formative and summative should be problem solving. If the MELC indicates that the students will compose a sentence, therefore, what we need to provide in the formative and the summative is composing sentences. Therefore, there should be a similarity as well on what we provide between the formative and the summative. If the MELC say that the students will compose a sentence with proper subject-verb agreement, therefore, the kind of assessment task that we provide is performance-based because each sentence among our students would vary and that would require a performance-based task. But if our students would, uh, are required in mathematics to solve a word problem, as indicated in the MELC, it requires a single correct answer. Therefore, it is part of written. So the variety of assessment strategy that you provide among your students would depend on the nature of the MELC that you are covering for your module. Then, um, yeah, um, the fourth principle indicated in debit order number 31 is that assessment and feedback is now is not only now the responsibility of the teachers inside the classroom, but it is now a shared responsibility among the teachers, learners, and the families. Meaning to say that when our learners perform tasks in a home-based situation, the kind of performance that the students produce are primarily seen by the parents. And before these performance tasks, for example, are produced by our learners, the parents can look at the criteria in the rubric and they can provide some preliminary feedback on the work of the learner so that the learner will have an opportunity to make improvements before submitting it to the teacher, especially when this is a summative assessment. And lastly, assessment and grading should have a positive impact on learning. Now, I have place a check mark on the second, third, and the fourth um, principles because these are the ones that we will be covering and focusing on in this morning's presentation. So first, this is just a review on what is not formative assessment and what is formative assessment. So when you say formative assessment, it doesn't refer to an instrument. Formative assessment is not simply a test. Formative assessment is not simply a quiz. Formative assessment is not simply a recitation. But rather, formative assessment is a collection of practices. And these practices include your instruction. These practices include your learning materials that are provided to the learner in such a way that these learners are able to meet your MELC. And we, when we put all of these interventions together with the results of your formative of your assessment, then assessment becomes formative. For example, at the beginning of the lesson, you provided an assessment whether your students can note details on the characters in the story that they have read. Then you provide your instructions on how to note details. Then you provide another round of formative assessment again. That first, that second round of formative assessment becomes formative if you found out that there are still some learners who are having difficulty in identifying the characters in a story. Therefore, provide again another reteaching in order to scaffold the students who are having difficulty. When you start providing that reteaching based on the results of the previous assessment, then therefore the function now becomes formative. So your practice on assess, teach, assess, teach is an entire practice of formative assessment. But if you simply teach once and then assess after, that is not, and then move on to the next lesson, that is not formative assessment. Formative assessment provides some form of reteaching again after you have assessed your students and found out that there are still some who are not able to attain your milk.
Now, take note, I think uh, everyone knows this one. Um, formative assessment is not graded because when you conduct your assessment before instruction and during instruction, there are students are still progressing. And there might be several students who are still not able to attain those learning competencies because instruction is not yet adequate for them. That's why you have to wait for several um, reteaching. And when the time comes that you saw that your students are able to meet the MELC, that's the time that you provide your summative, which is now graded. In that way, formative assessment is used to help the learner move towards learning the next MELC in the sequence. Okay, and I think you all know that um, you don't use formative assessment to punish your students when they are noisy or not participating or when they are not um, paying attention when you do your synchronous learning. But rather, formative assessment is a technique, okay, in order to optimize and support their learning. Um, now, we have more opportunities to do formative assessment. Why? Because you have more time and you have more time because the number of MELC is very decongested. For example, if you will look at the grade nine English, there are only 10 um, learning competencies for the entire school year. So it's about um, three learning competencies that you need to um, take up for every quarter. And you have more opportunities to conduct formative assessment uh, for the different grade levels across different subject areas. All right, now, um, Black and William provided us with an important definition of... Um, formative assessment. And um, I think this one also supports much of our guidelines and principles as indicated in Deped Order Number 8 and Deped Order Number 31, 2020. That the first um, important um, aspect is that it's integrated with our instruction and this is conducted before, during, and after our instructional processes. Okay? And then um, right after we conduct our formative assessment, we need to take a look at the results so that we can immediately make adjustments in our instruction. If we do not make adjustments in our instruction, despite seeing the results of our formative assessment, then the function of formative assessment is not fulfilled. The ASCD has provided us with a set of guidelines on how we actually conduct formative assessment. And this um, flowchart here is a guide on how we do formative assessment and integrate it in our instruction. Formative assessment starts when our learners becomes aware of your learning goal. In our case, our learning goal is your MEL, our most essential learning competency. For example, the most essential learning competency is um, write a descriptive paragraph in English. Okay. So at the beginning of your module, you now inform your students that at the end of the module, the students will have to compose a paragraph that describes different events. Okay? So the student needs to become aware of that. The next step is to determine the current status of your students. Given that your milk is to uh, compose okay, a paragraph, you can now look at the guidelines attached to Deped Order Number 31, which is now the CARB book. So the CARB book is what we have developed um, in the basic education sector transformation that was funded by the Australian government. So it's actually attached in Deped Order Number 31. And the CARB book, the classroom-based assessment book, um, tells us how we actually decompose or make subtasks out of a MELC. There are two things that we can uh, decompose from your MELC. One is that what students should know about that MELC and what students should be able to do for that MELC. Now, in determining the current status of the students, you can start um, creating subtasks for that particular MELC. So when a student composes a paragraph, what should students know? Okay, so this is a descriptive paragraph. Number one, the student should know that a paragraph should be a sequence of coherent sentences. That should be important. And second one, um, they need to have knowledge about adjectives in order to make description. And there are also other parts of speech that can be used as modifiers, such as your adverbs. These are some of the things that they need to know. So you, need, you can have two subtasks. And what the student should be able to do, they should be able to compose paragraph in the proper form, such as putting a title, putting indention, 
following proper mechanics in the composition process. This is what they need to do. All right. So you can disaggregate this one and assess that one when you want to determine the current status of the learners. You can start giving them sentences and make them underline what is the modifier in the sentence as a prelude to describing. You can ask them to write two sentences, then three sentences, and try to check out whether these sentences are coherent with each other. So in other words, you're now building on, you're asking the students to write a descriptive paragraph, even without instruction yet. And your purpose here is to check whether they can do it and whether they know it. Once you're able to see that there are students who are having difficulty, let's say, for example, some students compose a paragraph, but it is not describing, okay? If you look at the red part of the box here, it says here that your next step is to provide student feedback, okay? Look at the paragraph now. Therefore, provide a feedback to this learner who, is, who composed a paragraph, but it is not describing. So you now tell the learner, okay, look at your paragraph. Okay, the paragraph needs to describe your favorite pet, not what your pet does when he wakes up in the morning. It should be describing, okay, why you like your pet. Describe what your pet looks like. Okay, so you can now provide additional questions. That's your feedback. Take note that when you provide feedback, you don't tell your students that your work is poor, your work is bad, your work is ugly, your work needs improvement. These are bad feedback because they are broad. It needs to be specific on what the student should be able to do. We'll talk about more on feedback a little bit later in one of the principles. After you provide the feedback, you can now move on to providing instructional correctives. Show the student what, for example, a, a descriptive paragraph looked like, and that can be a model that can that they can use. And then let the student rewrite the paragraph. So this is now the green part here below evaluating student progress. Then collect again the revisor, provide additional feedback, provide additional instructional corrective. Let the student rewrite it again. It goes through a cycle of feedback, instructional corrective, revision, and resubmission, and feedback again, and instructional correctives again. It goes through that cycle until the student is able to meet your criteria in writing the descriptive paragraph. And when they start meeting your criteria, then they move closer towards your milk, and that is the yellow part. Then, meaning to say, when they are now able to meet your criteria, as indicated in your rubric, then they have attained the milk. You now start grading that paragraph. So ideally, no one should fail in your summative assessment, if the proper feedback, instructional corrective, resubmission, and revision process takes place appropriately within the cycle, then no one should fail in your summative assessment. So this is how formative assessment supports your summative. And this is the cycle on how you actually do it. And this is very much feasible to do now because you have very few milk that needs to be taken up for every quarter. So here, if you look into the diagram and process that we went through on how you actually conduct formative assessment, okay, then um, in, you will notice that it is very much embedded with instruction. It is not your usual way of teach, 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 and then towards the end, assess. No. While you're actually teaching, you are simultaneously assessing. And after every formative assessment, you see some changes, when your student goes through that revision process, you see that their work is improving. There are changes now in terms of the performance of the learners. There are also changes in your instruction because you change your approach depending on what the student needs and depending on what you saw as part of their difficulties and their weaknesses. And it's very important that instructional correctives are actually provided, teaching the learners how to pull out the answer, teaching learners strategies on how to arrive at the answer can be part of your instructional strategies. Teaching um, learners and showing them models on how it should look like are part of your instructional correctives. Okay, now, uh, here are different ways. Given that um, formative and summative assessment are now conducted across different um, learning deliveries, which can be um, online or print modules as you apply now in your different um, schools, um, there are different ways on how we mark or check formative and summative assessment. 
when you conduct formative assessment um, online, you usually make use of different applications such as your Google Forms, your MS Form, or make use of exam.net. Okay, I think uh, most of you are familiar with the Google Forms and the MS Forms where when there are right and wrong answers, okay, um, they are automatically checked and you immediately get the score. So it's now um, easy to provide feedback on the work of your students. Now in the exam.net, okay, um, it's a good platform for you to do later on your summative assessment because when your student attempts to minimize the window and try to look for answers in other websites, okay, um, the exam.net stops. The student is unable to go and continue with the assessment and immediately exam.net informs you that your student attempts to minimize the window and open another website. So you can immediately alert the learners. Another way of um, delivering your formative assessment is if you can um, uh, directly put in your assessment protocols, the items and instructions directly in your learning management system, such as your IVLE, your Moodle, your Blackboard, or your Canvas or your Google Classroom. But when you use Google Classroom, uh, you integrate and um, put inside the Google Forms to conduct your formative assessment. And um, if your formative assessment requires a right and wrong answer, the work now is easy because um, it is now automatically checked. However, if um, your formative assessment requires open-ended responses, such as essays, short answer, um, you'll have to um, schedule some time to check the student's work and then send to them the feedback in terms of their scores and how they perform towards the criteria. Now, how do you send your feedback to your students? Feedback are sent in a variety of ways. One is through a discussion board. Okay, You can collate all of the feedback about those bits and pieces of things that you have observed in the student's work and then put it in as part of your discussion board. Discussion board can occur, let's say, like in a group chat, like in a messenger group chat or in a Google Hangouts where you enumerate all of your observations. And then let the students um, react to these observations. Or you can pose in some questions based on some of the difficulties, um, what you have actually seen on the student's work, and then let your students respond to these particular questions, okay? Um, you can indicate there, there are some of you who did not put a title, why is this so, okay? And then you can mention some of the names of these students or message them personally, why did you not put a title? Why did you not put an indention? Why are you not putting period in between sentences, okay? So you can put it, frame it in a question form so that they would respond to some of the difficulties. So feedback can occur in a discussion board when you type by a group chat or your feedback can actually be given during your synchronous session. So in your synchronous session, rather than repeating what you have um, provided in the materials in your asynchronous, what you can actually do in your synchronous session is time spent in providing feedback on the student's work. If um, the time is spent in providing more feedback in terms of the student's work, then the formative assessment becomes a powerful tool on making improvement in terms of their performance. Why? Because they, they now specifically know how to make improvements in their work and how to do the revision process exactly. Now, um, it's also very important that part of the formative assessment is monitoring the student's progress towards time. So therefore, um, across several formative assessments, the students need to be able to see and chart their performance from the first formative assessment going onwards so that your students can start to think of ways on how to make improvements in their learning. Okay, now if you are using a print module as part of your delivery modes, because there might be some learners who doesn't have um, internet access, okay? So um, the formative assessment, the exercises, the instructions for your performance tasks for your formative assessment is now embedded as part of the print module. Now, how is the checking done? you need to have a separate document that contains an answer key. And the answer key is given to the parent. And when the learner finishes that formative assessment, the parent can now give the answer key and the learner can check on their own or the parent or any adult at home can do the checking. Or if you have a group of PTA who will do the checking of the formative assessment, they can be the one to distribute the answer key. Now, part of the process is when you provide the answer key, there should be processing on why the answers are wrong and how the answers can be derived correctly. Okay, so these are some challenges for
formative assessments on print modules. Now, basically, the same is done for the summative assessment, except that in an online platform, the students are not allowed to open any websites and their notes to get the correct answer. And when you do the assessment online, you need to monitor your students while they are answering. You need to open your Google Meet or your Zoom and you need to um, take a look at how your students are answering. You need to look at their surroundings while they are answering. You need to be present online in order to avoid any forms of cheating. Now, if this is an open response, like your summative assessment is an essay or short answer, you need also to do some video monitoring and watch them while they are answering. Okay, here is now the challenge when you do the summative assessment for print modules. Okay, of course, um, the validity of the answers. Okay, uh, of course, you could not see the learner while they're doing it if they do it at home. Therefore, you need to strategically partner with um, your PTA or with your local government units or in the barangay halls where they can actually do the summative assessment there. If your summative assessment requires right and wrong answers, okay, the summative assessment are handed over to your students by the LGU personnel, like for example, the barangay captain, and there's a place there in the barangay hall where, of course, it's sanitized, you practice social distancing. The student sits there and they accomplish the task there. And the barangay captain, for example, is looking at them while they answer. And it's collected again by the barangay captain and it is sent to the school for checking if there's a right and wrong answer. If the summative assessment is a performance task, the student can record or simply produce the product and they can send it over or drop it in a drop box or in a kiosk and then you can collect it um, there. So that's how you actually um, do the checking for the summative assessment. And then feedback is provided when you put notes, you attach the note to the final product and you return it to the child using through the kiosk or through the through the Dropbox. This actually worked um, with CHED. Um, this is a system uh, as part of the standards for flexible learning delivery for print modules that we have worked out with um, CHED in some of the regions in the Philippines. And this actually worked out if you make specific guidelines and establish good partnerships with external um, agencies like your LGU and um, barangay captains. All right. Um, let's call on now again, okay, our volunteer, uh, let me um, stop again. Uh, teacher Des, okay, who is our, do, do we have another volunteer or we uh, call again Sir Ponzi and Sir Mark? Uh, we, we only have two volunteers. Sir. Okay, so we'll have to call in again Sir Ponzi. Yes. yes, sir. Okay, Sir Ponzi, are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen again. I'm going to give you three situations. Okay, and given that particular situation, okay, you'll have to tell me if that situation is formative or summative. Clear? Okay, sir. Okay, so I'll be reading the situation. The first one. The teacher provides drills and exercises in math after demonstrating the addition of decimals for practice. After checking, the addition is taught again for the learners who could not get the correct answer. Is this formative or summative? Formative, sir. Okay, why is this formative? Because it's only just a practice from the word. Okay, and, and, and it's and been uh, followed uh, by. It's been taught again, so the teacher. Yes, is, uh, yes it is taught again. Yes, it is taught again, especially because there are still learners who are having difficulties. That's why this is formative. Okay, next one. The teacher gave several short stories to be read by learners. In each story, the characters and setting are identified. Students who could not identify the characters and setting well are provided with additional learning materials. Is this formative or summative? Another formative example, sir. Again, again? Another formative. Yeah, so this is formative. Why is this formative? Because uh, after the teacher have uh, read the story, uh, students mm -hmm. who could not identify the characters have been provided additional learning materials so they can yeah. cope with the activity. Very good. Yeah. So the provision 
of additional learning materials is a support that you're actually providing for the learners further. Okay? Yeah, that's why this is formative. Uh, yeah, another one for you, sir. Okay, so after several exercises on problem solving involving factoring of polynomials, 95% of the lear learners are able to execute the task. They are given a test to determine if they are ready to move to the next learning competency. What is this? Formative or summative? Summative is assessment. Yeah, what, yeah, this is summative. Why is this summative? Because the uh, teacher already gave a test to the uh -huh. test. A test to the students to determine so, if they are ready to the next learning yeah. competency. Yeah, yeah. If that is now your the decision that you want to make, if the learners are ready to move on to the next learning competency, and given that majority of the learners have already attained that uh, that learning competency, which is actually ninety five percent, which is quite large already, then um, yeah, you can. Um, this is already considered as your summative. All right. Thank you, Sir Ponzi. Can we call on now the next one, Sir Mark? Hello, Paul. Yeah. Hi, sir, Mark. Okay, here is the next situation. The teacher in PE allows the student to practice the folk dance and feedback is provided. Formative or summative? Sir, Mark? Oh, wait. No. <laughs> so, yeah. So, students are practicing and while the students are practicing, the teacher gives feedback. You need to dance gracefully. Make sure you uh, dance all together, all at the same time. Follow the beat. Uh, formative think, or summative? I think it's a formative. Why is this formative? Uh, because the teacher uh, provides feedback to the students. While? Uh, uh, on, during their practice. During the practice time. Is uh -huh. it graded already? Is it graded during the practice time? It should not be graded. It should not be great because the students are still practicing. Yes. Meaning to say, during the practice time, they're still progressing. That's yes. why this is formative. Okay, next one, Sir Mark. After practicing how to play tennis, the students are informed to have a final demonstration of the sport. Formative or summative? Uh, summative, sir. Yeah, why is this summative? Uh, they are done already practicing. So I think uh, the teacher think that the students are already prepared to take the final demonstration. Okay. Okay. That's why this is summative. All right. So thank you, um, Sir Mark and Sir Ponzi. Okay. So we move on now to our to um, the nine principles Okay, of formative assessment. What you need to think about in the nine principles of formative assessment is in terms of the concept on how we understand it, how we use the result, and the pra practice that entails in the conduct of the formative assessment. Okay, the first principle is that formative assessment works along with the idea of assessment for learning and assessment as learning. Um, like what we have emphasized at the beginning of our presentation, that when you start using assessment results to help your students learn better, this is the idea of what you call as assessment for learning. When your students saw the results of their assessment and becomes aware of their own strengths and weaknesses based on the results of the assessment, and they start to think of ways on how to make improvements in their performance, then this is assessment as learning. Now, given that um, the teaching and the learning process are actually delivered across a different variety of modes, okay, we now coined the term assessment for flexible learning. In the concept of assessment for flexible learning, we are able to meet the idea of assessment for learning where results of assessment are used to make improvements on student learning by adding two important ideas or elements into it. The first one is that in order for us to make use of assessment to um, improve our instruction, we need to integrate assessment tasks as part of the teaching and the learning process. In that way, we're making assessment accessible across a variety of delivery modes. We now look at your print module. Look at now your online module. Did we provide assessment as part of the format at the beginning of the lesson? 
while the lesson is ongoing, did we provide some reteaching in between our formative assessment? Okay? And was there an assessment towards the end? Does it provide opportunity for you to add in additional lesson if majority of your students are not yet able to master and meet the milk that you are covering? So this is what we mean when you say making assessment accessible at various modes of instructional delivery. Look at the format. Is it embedded where there is assessment before, during, and after? And is reteaching embedded in between your instruction while you are providing the milk? The second one is that we have to ensure that the assessment that we are providing is of quality. When you say is of quality, you're making use of the right kind of or right strategy of assessing whether it is appropriate to use a written work for that task or is it appropriate to do a performance-based task for that particular milk. And when you do the assessment, are you following the important principles and guidelines? All right. This is the idea of assessment for flexible learning. Principle number two. It's very important that we don't look at assessment as something separate with instruction anymore. That you do all of the instruction, you dump all of the contents to your students, and towards the end of the content, that's when you do the assessment. Okay, this doesn't follow the idea of formative assessment. In the idea of formative assessment, it is now embedded with instruction, meaning to say that while you are teaching, assessment is ongoing. Example, if you have a print module, and the students will have to read a lengthy paragraph. You can actually put questions okay, in between the paragraphs to check for students' understanding. You can put in some um, prompts in between each of the paragraphs so that the students can actually think aloud in between paragraphs. So this, is, this is part of um, formative assessment being embedded as the student is doing self-study. Okay? Um, when you're doing online, um, you can structure your Google Forms in such a way that the first reading material is on top, followed by a series of questions, and then the students can immediately type in their answer. They read again the next um, set of materials, and then they can type their questions that follows, and then they can type in and send their questions right after. You can structure that one, making use of Google Forms when you're doing uh, an online delivery mode. Okay. Principle. Number three, formative assessment should help students focus on the learning goal. Meaning to say, when you start structuring your formative assessment, you assess one milk at a time, okay? Considering that you only have very few milk, so you can cover up at, uh, one milk for two to three weeks because you have 11 weeks for the first quarter or one to two weeks for one particular milk. So ideally, one milk, can correspond to one learning module. In order, when, when one learning module is devoted for the teaching of one milk, therefore, your assessment is devoted to assessing that particular milk. Therefore, it helps you focus whether your students are able to attain that particular milk or not and do something and provide further intervention if your students are not able to attain it. Therefore, if we focus on the learning goal, the learning goal needs to be informed, that MELT needs to be informed to the learners as part of your learning module. That needs to be made clear to them at the beginning of the lesson. Example, tell them at the beginning of your learning module that when you go through this module, um, everyone should be able to write a sentence following right subject verb agreement. If this is mathematics, okay, at the end of this particular module, everyone should be able to explain the process of water cycle. Okay. And if we are able to focus on one learning competency for every module, we should be able to see change. Because if assessment is continuously done for that one learning competency before, during, and after, we should be able to see progress and change for that learning competency over time until the students are able to meet your milk. Principle number four, okay? Diagnostic assessment is in fact part of your formative assessment. Diagnostic assessment is your formative assessment that is given before instruction. So if you assess your students before instruction on the target competency, 
Okay? You are now able to determine at the beginning of the lesson who among the students know and do not know that particular topic. You will be able to determine who among your students can perform and cannot perform that particular task at the beginning of the lesson. You will now be able to identify what are their particular strengths and weaknesses when executing such tasks. You will be able to um, see misconceptions of your students. You'll be able to see some of their confusions at the beginning. Therefore, if you saw these particular misconceptions at the beginning of the lesson, then um, it's now easy to make adjustments in your instruction. Okay, let me just do some um, conversations now. Teacher Des, your uh, yeah, I think you're on. Your microphone is on. Can I have a yes. short, a bit of conversation with you, Teacher Des? Yes. yes, sir. Okay, Teacher Des, what subject area are you teaching? Uh, I'm teaching grade seven. Uh, okay, what I'm, subject? I mean, I'm teaching English for grade seven students. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, now Teacher Des, for example, you're my student, and I'm going to do now a diagnostic assessment. Okay. or formative assessment before instruction. Okay, okay. teacher Des, um, what do you need every day so that you will be able to survive, so that you'll be strong and healthy? What do you take in? Um, I think I need vitamins. Um, okay, and the vitamins are taken from what? From, from the foods. like From vegetables. the food that you eat, right? Yeah, from the, the food that you eat. Where do you get the food that you eat, teacher Des? From the market. Oh, yeah. So it's taken out from plant sources or animal yes, sources. Okay. Um, Teacher Des, do all living things need food in order to survive? Yes, they do. Okay. So are plants living things? Yes. Okay. So if plants are living things, do they need food to survive? Yes, they need. They need food. Therefore, plants have a food, Teacher Des, uh -huh. right? Yes, yes, they do have. Do you agree with me? Yes. No changing of answers, okay? Um. Okay, now, what is now the food of the plant? Tell me. Um, we have water, fertilizer, such as, we, we have worms, like right? Um, soil, um, carbon dioxide, sunlight. Okay. okay, so teacher Des, plants drink water, yes or no? Yes. Okay, so plants um, eat the fertilizer, teacher Des? Yes, they do. Okay, they do. Okay, of now. Course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, let's say, for example, in this particular answer, okay, take note of the answer of teacher Des that the plants drink water <laughs> and the plants eat the fertilizer. <laughs> All right. And um, I and uh, therefore, the water and the fertilizer are the food of the plant. Mm -hmm. That's your point, teacher Des, right? Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's quite confusing. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. So, in this particular set of questioning that I went through with Teacher Des, I'm now able to find out that Teacher Des has a misconception about the process of photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because, number one, what is her confusion? She is um, assuming that the plants eat in the same way like humans. For human beings, our food sources are external. But for plants, it's different. Plants make their own Food. Okay? So if plants make their own food, therefore, the water and the fertilizer are actually not the food of the plants. But the water is part of the production process, but they're not the food. The food is the byproduct of that production process. Okay? Um, yeah, so this is now a misconception of teacher Des. So the sun, the fertilizer and the water are not the food of the plant. Okay? It's the byproduct of that photosynthesis process is actually the food. Okay, let me go back to teacher Ponzi and um, Mark here. Can you, both of you, turn on your microphones? Ponzi and Mark, what subject areas are you teaching? I mean, I have practical research too. Ah, research too. Mark, what are you teaching? I'm teaching research and science, po, sir. Okay, for senior high? Yes, sir. All right, all right. So, both of you, do you know what is the food of the plant? Uh, basically, it's sunlight and water. Uh, you, see, you have the miscon same misconception as of teacher dead. Sir Ponzi, do you know what is the food of the plant? I was confused later. Because... Uh -huh, okay, okay. So, again, 
the That's sunlight, no the water, and the fertilizer are not the food of the plant because plants make their own food. It's actually the byproduct of using those um, nutrients from the soil and the water that is actually the food. Okay, from the audience here, okay, who knows what is now the food of the plant? <laughs> okay, hello, let me hello, Carlo. Yes, yes, sir, Milano Torres. Yes, sir. Um, from PNU, right? Yes, sir. I think we're friends on Facebook, right? Yes, sir, you're my stat, uh, consultant, sir. Ah, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, sir, Milano Torres, what is the food okay. of the plant? Uh, sir, actually, if you're going to study photosynthetic mm -hmm. process, so the, the, the input will be carbon dioxide and water. Yeah, but what is the food of the plant? The output carbohydrates and oxygen ah uh, is it really carbohydrates it contains some sort the of output of carbohydrates the it contains some form of carbohydrate but it's not really purely carbohydrates okay michelle you know the food of the plant okay let me just give you the answer the food of the plant is a simple form of sugar called glucose <laughs> okay it's actually sugar that's a byproduct okay so most of us grew with the idea that we're thinking that the food of the plant is actually um, the sunlight the sunlight the water and the fertilizer but that's a misconception you see from the initial form of questioning that I've conducted before my instruction, I'm now able to um, determine some misconception. Therefore, I teach it to you immediately. I don't have to wait for a specific period of time to provide such correction. Usually, you start with defining, you start by explaining the entire photosynthesis process, but towards the end, the students still don't know what the food of the plant is. Okay, so immediately provide now your intervention when you have seen that your students have some misconception. Give them immediately what is the right concept. Immediately provide the clarification. So this is one of the good um, functions of formative assessment that when you have seen these weaknesses, when you've seen this misconception, you teach it right away. Okay, you don't have to um, wait for the lesson to occur. All right, so um, let's, um, Teacher Des, you're still there? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, so you see now the function of assessment before instruction. Okay, so teacher death, what is the food of the plant? It's um, glucose. <laughs> glucose or a simple form of sugar. So it's not the water. And the, so okay. teach that to your student. So you see now the, the, what, what I was, was trying to do here. What I'm trying okay, to do here. You know what, sir? It's like um, quite confusing when you are like saying some, you know, it's, it's about the choice of the verbs actually. Like, Oh, uh -huh. it only absorbs the water. It only absorbs the sun, the heat of the sunlight. But I did uh -huh. not think of the the verb eat. So that's actually what the it is. The plant. Yes. The plant absorbs the water. Yeah. It it should be absorbed, not eat. The the, the plant eats the absorbs. It you know, uh, it it's it. <laughs> yes. Eat. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean eat. Uh -huh. E a t. Yes. No, no, it's it. <laughs> oh, okay. the plant absorbs water, not uh -huh. eat water. Yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah. So this is actually um, what you um, uh, what you do once you are able to immediately see some misconceptions at the beginning of the lesson, which is part of your formative assessment. Then uh, immediately do some corrections. Okay. You see the value of doing that. All right. Um, let's now move on to the uh -oh. let's now move on to the next principle. Okay. So principle number five. Okay, formative assessment moves from determining discrete skills to integrated skills. This is applicable especially if you have several learning competencies simultaneously going on, or if the teaching of learning competencies are integrated to each other, like your um, language and literacy skills. Now, take note that language and literacy skills, the teaching of that one is holistic and integrated. So, meaning to say, while the students are composing sentences, they need to integrate skills on vocabulary and grammar and comprehension as well. So therefore, the teaching of these skills are integrated on language and literacy. And therefore, the assessment can be, the formative assessment can be continuous. And this is how you actually um, do it. For example, during your first week, assess reading comprehension by noting details um, like character setting of the story. Now, on by the second week, 
you're continuing to assess the reading comprehension. But at the same time, you now start to assess subject-verb agreement together with the assessment of reading comprehension. Example, you have a story. You provide them a story in your formative assessment. There are the first three questions would assess reading comprehension. The next two questions would start to assess the subject-verb agreement, but the platform is taken from a single story. And it's all given together. So therefore, you can have five questions for it. The first three is on reading comprehension. The next two are on subject-verb agreement. Okay. Now, you do it continuously where, while you're assessing these two competencies. By the third week, for example, you have seen that the students have already mastered reading comprehension skill. You can leave that one behind, but continue assessing by the third week, okay? Subject-verb agreement. Then introduce another lesson, which is figures of speech. And then you can assess this time figures of speech together with subject-verb agreement in one assessment task. So you see, it's carried on. The skill is carried on in your formative assessment when you go from one learning competency to another so that um, you can give more time in reteaching and reassessing that particular learning competency. So this is um, principle number five. Okay. In principle number six, okay, formative assessment becomes effective if this is continuously done in between reteaching and there are several forms of assessment. So meaning to say you do not only provide one formative assessment, but it should be several. When you provide several practice sets to your students, um, they become more at ease in executing the task when they are provided with more opportunities of doing it. That's why if you will be looking at the model as shown in the screen, okay, so you see that assessment is provided at the beginning before instruction, which is your diagnostic, followed by instruction. Then assess again. Then revise your instruction by providing and reteaching. Then assess again. You don't stop the cycle until the students are able to attain your learning competency. Now, this is a sample flow of the lesson, a structured in an online type of learning in your module. So usually in your format, you begin by informing the learners of what is the learning competency. Then this is followed by your pre-assessment. So your pre-assessment can be given as part of your asynchronous or it's part of the independent study of the learner. Now, this is now part of, okay, um, Sir Mark, can you please turn on your microphone? Sir Mark? Yes, sir. Okay, so look at number two. When you conduct your pre-assessment, which is now part of your asynchronous in an online lesson, is this formative or summative? Number two, sir. Uh, yeah. I think it's formative. Yeah, it's still part of formative because there's no support or instruction provided yet. Now, then uh, usually after your initial um, formative assessment, you now provide some processing and motivation before you actually go to your actual lesson. Your motivation should be able to scaffold and provide some support to whatever you found out in your pre-assessment. So your motivation now becomes part, Sir Mark, of formative or summative. Still formative, sir. It is still part of your formative. Take note that in your motivation, you're already teaching. Okay, but it is part of formative assessment. Then you go to your lesson proper. You're now teaching. And again, it is part of your formative ass assessment because that um, lesson proper should be able to support whatever results you got from your pre-assessment. Therefore, the motivation and the lesson proper are part of your formative assessment because they are addressing whatever you found out in your pre-assessment in your number two. And take note that you can do your pre-assessment, your motivation, and lesson proper as part of your asynchronous. Then, of course, after your lesson proper, assess again. Okay? When you assess again to check whether your students have learned from your motivation and lesson proper, Sir Mark, is this formative or summative? Uh, it still depends, sir. I think it's it would be summative if most of the students were able to get the, yes. the, the lesson well. If not, yes. you, know, you have to make it formative. And it, very good. I like, I like your point. Okay, I like your point, Sir Mark, that if majority of your students, let's say 99%, have attained it already, it now becomes summative. But if majority are still not, then it is formative. Very good, Sir Mark. Okay. 
then. Uh, if majority are still not able to um, provide the answer, you can now provide another form of reteaching, which is part of your asynchronous. You can probably make a videotape of yourself teaching the learning competency. And if that is the case, if this is addressing the results of number five in your previous assessment, it is part of, Sir Mark? Uh, still uh, formative, sir. Still formative. Okay. And then after that reteaching, assess again. Try to see if your students uh, mastered it or not. Let's say if not, you now you use your synchronous learning, okay, to provide feedback. Mm -hmm. And if you use your synchronous learning to provide further feedback, then it becomes part, sir, mark of your. Uh, come again, sir. Synchronous teaching. If the synchronous learning. Yeah, you're now spending time with your students, telling them when you write your essay, this is okay. how should it be done. It is still formative, sir. It is still uh, formative. Mm -hmm. Let's say after that one, okay, um, majority of your learners, okay, you have seen that they can now do it, mm -hmm. and you now give your final assessment, then it is now your? Summative, sir. Summative. All right. So this is the flow of your module if you embed formative assessment along with it. It's clear, Sir Mark, how you embed it as part of your module, whether it is going to be online or print. Yes, yeah, Sally, you have a question, Sally? Sally, your mic. Sorry, sir. I'm sorry. Yeah, you have a question. Go ahead. Okay. Now, principle number seven. Feedback is an important part of your formative assessment. And feedback can be a form of teaching and instruction as well. Because your learners learn more from feedback rather than lecturing the concepts. Okay. So feedback needs to be given alongside every time that you provide your formative assessment. And feedback is given, okay, in two ways. When after the students complete a particular task, you can give your feedback. Or while students are doing the task, you can actually provide feedback. What is helpful in terms of feedback is the second one. While your students are doing the task, like a performance task. Okay, once feedback are already gi given while the students are doing it in a performance task, it is more helpful because the students can immediately um, change and revise their work once you gave your feedback immediately. Okay, now um, I will, uh, I'd like to show you an example how feedback is actually um provided okay i'm going to show you a video and take note in the video how the coaches provide feedback so this is the performance okay let me just check can you see the screen can you see the video teacher desk can you see the video uh, yes sir. Okay, okay, let's continue. Thank you. Hello. Um, sir, there's no audio. No uh, th there's no audio? Yes, we cannot hear the, the video. I mean the audio of that video. Okay. How about this one? Can you hear it? Still not, sir. Huh? No, sir. I uh, know. Okay. Doc Mado. Oh. Uh huh. I think you have to um, stop sharing the screen and then share the video again and then click computer with computer sound. Okay, I stop sharing and then click the share on, screen. Yeah. You click on the share screen, sir, again. And then okay, and then you click on the share audio. I think it's uh, share, share audio. computer sound. It's in the bottom, sir. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. Sounds. Okay. And then after sounds. And then you click on share, sir. Share computer sound and then click on share. So when you click the oh. share screen, um, you click the video and then there will be a window that will pop up. Um, uh, at the bottom of that window, there, um, there's an information there that says click the computer sound. Okay. Let me um, check here. Media server, video folder. So I'm now clicking the video. Uh-oh, 
I don't know how to do it. Okay, anyway, we'll st- I'll study this one. Okay, I don't know how to do this one. So let's just um, move on and um, talk about um, how feedback is actually um, given. All right, sorry, sorry. Um, I'll just probably um, send in the video to everyone. Okay, can you see the screen again? Okay, sorry, I don't know how to do it. Uh, we'll study. Okay, I'll just send you the video later on. Okay, so generally, I just wanted to demonstrate how the STAR model actually um, works by looking at how the, the voice coaches actually did the STAR model. Okay, now, here are some of the important characteristics and when you provide feedback. Okay, first one is that um, it should relate to the performance in terms of the student's learning goals. Um, when you start making your criteria for the rubric that you will use to assess your performance, okay, it should be based on the contents of your learning competency. And then when you start providing your feedback, your criteria should be the main source of the content of your feedback. So feedback your students on how well they are able to meet the criteria. Um, also, when you provide the feedback to your students, teach your students ways on how they will meet your criteria. These are strategies that they need okay, to meet the goal. When you provide feedback, it should tell about how to move your students to progress from the present performance going to your target performance. Example, if the student during, um, during a declamation have a soft voice, you can um, tell your student, okay, make your voice louder, okay? So in that way, it suggests ways on what the student needs to do so that you see movement or change from the present behavior to the target behavior that you want. And then um, when you give feedback, give it right after. You don't have to wait for the students to make several mistakes before you give your feedback. And feedback needs to be specific. That's why a while ago, we were saying that um, saying very good, very bad, ugly, needs improvement, excellent, good work are not good feedback because they're not descriptive of the task. Examples of good feedback would be um, you use several colors and the colors are appropriate for the object. So you see, it's descriptive of the work. Okay, You might want, if the student, for example, in art only use the color black in coloring all of the parts of the drawing, you might say, Okay, you might want to try other colors as well because you only use one color rather than saying it's ugly because you only use color black. Okay, so you see, it should be descriptive and what and tells the student what needs to be done. Okay, you can focus on key errors, like for example, in the example that I have provided. Okay, yeah, you can put in more some decorations at this part because the decorations are concentrated in one part. Okay. Um, if this is uh, an essay or a work of the students, okay, the research question needs to contain at least two variables. And these two variables should be explained as part of the literature review. Okay, so you see you are, you're correcting some of the things that are not found in their work. And of course, um, we all know that you cannot um, grade the efforts of the student as part of the criteria because it's not observable, but you can actually acknowledge um, students' effort as part of your feedback. Now, um, feedback is not verbal all of the time, especially when feedback is being done while the students are performing, okay? Um, one of the many ways on how you can give feedback while the students are performing so that your students are not interrupted is by using nonverbal feedback or nonverbal cues. Examples would be an emblem. Okay, your emblem can be signals, okay, that you communicate particular messages to your students. Like when you do this one, you're now telling your students to wait for a while. Okay, right, right, you're doing the right thing. Okay, or when you do this one, you stop. But make sure that you orient your students what you mean by the emblems that you're using. Sometimes you're also making use of illustrators like this one, okay, meaning to say, okay, you stop, okay. Uh, if you want to reinforce a particular message, you do hand gestures like this one if you want your students to elaborate further. If you want to make a point, okay, um, and telling your students to emphasize on that one, you can use some illustrators. 
All right, so these are some feedback. You can also invent some of your emblems and illustrators as long as you tell your students what they mean. All right, then uh, principle number nine. Formative assessment tells you or informs you that you can decide the movement of one instruction to the next or from one mail to another mail. Okay, therefore, the information is used to inform the students when they are progressing and when they are ready to move on towards the next learning competency. This is also their guide when they do their own self-paced learning in your module. At the beginning of the school year, you already gave all of your all of the learning on all of the online lessons or all of the print lessons for the entire first quarter. The students will know if they are ready to move on to the next lesson, if they are able to meet and progress in the formative assessment for that one lesson. And how will they know? You can actually create a progress chart. And in that progress chart, the students can chart their scores, whether they are improving or not, so that they will know if they need to move on to the next learning module. Principle number eight, you work out with students to reach out the learning goals, meaning to say, when your students are really having difficulty, teach them ways on how they will actually attain that particular mail. What do they need to do? Okay, give them further feedback, give them further instructional correctives, make them practice, give guided practice. Okay, so this is the link where you can actually um, download the slide and the articles related to formative assessment in my um, presentation this morning is actually indicated. Okay, I've also given the, the slides to the organizers and you can actually request it um, from the organizers. So this is how a lesson would look like if you embed formative assessment. Usually, um, when, this is, when this is a half-day work or a whole-day work, I ask my participants to um, create uh, one lesson integrating formative assessment for one learning competency. And this is, this is how it can look like. You start by telling the learners what the competency is, like classify the materials based on its ability to absorb water, float, sink, or undergo decay. Then you start with your diagnostic assessment. So the students will be given a set of materials and they will indicate if the set A absorbs water, B float in water, C sink in water, and D decay. And then they have to um, write the letter on the blank. So you can do this one in Google Forms, okay, together with instruction. Okay, and then their students will have to type in the letter of the correct answer for each of the matter presented. And then the teacher will provide the answer after and the task uh, and we'll ask the students to classify the chart on the board. So um, what can happen here is that the answers in Google Forms can actually um, come out immediately, and then a chart is going to be seen inside the Google Classroom on how the classification will look like for the life vest, for the metal rod, for the bottle, for the juice tetra pack, and for the vegetable. And then you can move on next to the lesson proper and start to ask some questions to your learners like, why do you think the styrofoam floats in water? Why do you think the metal rod sinks, et cetera, et cetera? And then you can go through another set of formative assessment where the students will give now their own examples of matter that absorbs water, floats, sink, and undergo decay. And then the examples will be classified by the students in your learning management system. So embed again another Google form, and then you can put there five... Um, areas in your Google form where the students will provide examples of map matter under each category, okay? And then the teacher, when they saw the answer, can actually um, provide feedback whether the classification done is accurate. And then you can go through another set. So this time, pictures are actually shown, let's say, in the Google Classroom for the students to um, look at. And then the students will have to type in in another chart what category does the pitcher belong to? Does it absorb water, float, sink, or undergo decay? And then the teacher can provide further feedback. Okay, and then later on, the students can do um, other forms of assessment. They can um, go out around the garden at their house, and they will collect matter, and they can um, categorize whether they absorb, float, sink, or undergo decay, and then they show their classification to the teacher. Okay, so these are ways on how, uh, yeah, on how um, formative assessment is actually embedded in the lesson. All right, so we can spend the next um, 20 minutes for most of your questions, which I'm glad to um, answer. Yeah, teacher desk, you can now um, take over and facilitate the question and answer.
Okay, fellow educators, it's now time for our question and answer um, session. You can uh, chat in our chat box. And also those who are watching live on YouTube, you can also drop your questions while, um, okay? So if you have questions, just uh, chat in our live chat on YouTube and also here in our Zoom. Just chat your yeah. question. Or you can turn on your microphone and just give me a question, yeah. Yeah. So teacher Des, if you also have a question, you can uh, ask me <laughs> to get the ball rolling. Yeah. Um, sir, I have, I have a question because um, Go ahead. in the public school, we only have one, one day for synchronous, uh, mm -hmm. synchronous learning. So yeah. how would I be able to effectively conduct my formative assessment if I only have one synchronous you know, learning? Okay, so the formative assessment is part of the asynchronous. It's synchronous. going to be part of the asynchronous. Mm -hmm. um, you use Google Classroom, teacher desk? Yes, I do, sir. But okay. you know, some of my students are really not into you know, using that kind of application. So what we do is we, we, um, we extend our time and we... Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, you know, we use our time to teach our students, oh, this is how the Google Classroom looks like. Or if you're going to be turning in your, your, assess, your quiz or your evaluation, you have to do it this way. So it will really take too much time to like, uh, teach them on how to really facilitate the Google Classroom instead of us you know, teaching the entire lesson because we have to concise it. Right, we have to okay. uh, focus on the lesson itself, and that's for the whole week. So, how could we effectively, you know, okay. uh, you know, teacher this? What you actually did is a good strategy uh -huh. because, in aside from teaching the actual lesson, you're also teaching them how to navigate through the learning management system. And you know, given that this is the kind of setup, what you did is very important. Mm -hmm. It's important for your students to know how to make use of the platform you know i think the difficulty is just going to be at the beginning but once you um do this and implement the use of the google classroom consistently until the second quarter until the third quarter then your students will get used to it and you can now focus more on the important milk that you will have to teach them you know at the beginning it's really part of the difficulty to teach them how to navigate through the google classroom but um, in time they will get used to it. And you know what you did by teaching them how to navigate? Yeah, that's actually a good strategy. You just have to be patient about it at this time. Yeah. Thank you, sir. And sometimes I actually do the screen recording of my, mm -hmm. let's say, for example, I am using my cell phone as a student for the Google Classroom so that I will be able to teach them how to uh, do it this way, how to chat on the stream, you know. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, yeah, it's actually a good one. Yeah, how actually, in fact, you're scaffolding them how to answer, which is actually a good practice. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank and you. We yeah. do have a question here now from me, okay. uh, Ms. Divina Ramel. For our school, we have given out one month modules. How can we have a good feedback provision? Okay, uh, is the module print or is the module online? Maybe we can uh, ask for Mom Divina to turn on her microphone and explain more of her question. Mom Divina? Okay. Now, uh, first, okay, how do we do feedback if this is online? Let me just give um, both answers for online and for print. Okay, so if this is going to be um, online, okay, if the formative assessments are done making use of Google Forms or MS Forms, okay? Um, if there are right and wrong answers, okay, immediately the students will see the scores and then the students can chart their progress. Now, the feedback from the teacher is taken up during a discussion board. So the formative assessment is followed, can be followed by a discussion board. Okay, after the first exercise, what is the discussion board? Everyone is there and then everyone can chat. 
from the formative assessment, the teacher calls out some of the difficulties that the students encountered while answering. The teacher poses that in the discussion board and tries to probe why are these difficult for them. Okay, so that's how the feedback is going to work. If this is performance, okay, the teacher sees the performance from the video that the students have submitted, if this is online, and then the teacher writes down all of the comments for all of the performances. And then the teacher poses these comments in the discussion board, and that is now the feedback. And tells specifically each student that this is my feedback for your specific work, redo your work. And you can put that in in a discussion board. Or another way, when you have already your schedule for your synchronous, you can verbally inform the students on your specific feedback and then let them revise. That's how you can effectively do feedback if this is online. Okay, what if it is print? Okay, <laughs> It's challenging. Okay, now, for example, let's start with performance-based because it's easier. The students have produced a product, an essay, okay? They submit to you the essay through a Dropbox. You get the essay. Of course, you put marginal notes on the essay. There is a schedule when the students submit and when there is also another schedule when you return it. Let's say Tuesday, they submit. And then Thursday, they have to come back and check whether you have returned it already. So before Thursday, you have to return the essay with your feedback on the sides in that same Dropbox. They get it. And then they will read your comment on their essay and then they rework and resubmit in the same Dropbox again. That's how you do it if you have a print module. Now, if there is a right and wrong answer, I guess we went through that one. You provide the answer key to the parents. Okay, yeah. Thank you so much, um, sir. And we do have another question here from YouTube from Cesar Restauro. Uh, good day. Will you please cite? Uh, with this. Good day. Will you please cite some strategies on how to observe performance tasks in a modular printed? Okay. So strategies to observe performance tasks. Okay. One, you cannot really observe if you're not there. Okay. So you need to assign a proxy. You need to assign eyes for you. Okay. Let me cite an example of how one school did it. Okay, one of the PTA projects that they did for one school is that they trained um, the parents on how to use the criteria in the rubric to provide feedback and how to observe a performance task, especially the process. Because the teacher will be able to assess the product, but the teacher won't be able to assess the process if they have not seen how it is done, especially if this is um, through a printed module. In this one school, um, in the PTA, part of the project of the PTA is that they mapped out a particular parent representative to be on a particular zone where the students are. So the, the instruction is provided in the module. When then they set a particular time when the learner or when the child is supposed to do the performance. So the performance is done in front of the assigned PTA or parent representative. And the parent representative is holding the criteria and that parent representative is the one that actually checks the rubric and provides the feedback. Which one of this one are you able to do and which one are you not able to do? We found out that the, the, the parent representatives are having difficulty with the rubric and it was easier for them to use a simple checklist with yes or no with the criteria broken apart. So they shifted to just using a checklist. Now, the parent representatives have devices with them and they can record um, what is going on. And then the recording is now sent to the teacher for further feedback. And some notes are actually sent to the child from the teacher if the feedback is actually, um, yeah, if, if there are some many things that need to be improved and if the learner needs to revise the performance. Okay, so this is one way. So you get an eyes that will represent you if you cannot really go to a particular location like a PTA. Okay, yeah, so this is one um, mode. And this mode becomes possible depending on really the capability of your school head on how they can link and partner with the PTA and other stakeholders. Yeah. 
Thank Other you questions. so much, sir. Um, now we have from Bursamin of Indonesia. For the internal oh. assessor in industry, what's the difference between assessment and auditor of the ISO? Uh, what is the difference between the auditor of the ISO and the... Assessment and, the, and auditor of the ISO. Assessment and the auditor of the... Okay. So actually, both the assessment and the auditor of the ISO are both raters. They're both observers. The auditor, okay, is another point of view. Okay? So the assessor will do the actual assessment. The auditor will also do the assessment. You need both of the results to see whether there's actually consistency. Whether there's actually consistency. Uh oh. Whether there's a, whether there's actually consistency in between the ratings. That's why the auditor's um, rating is also important. Uh oh. Someone is shouting at me. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, teacher Des. Please turn off your microphone. <laughs> I think it's okay. Now. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So, next question. Okay. In next question. primary levels, okay, I think maybe there's a question from Maria Irene de los Santos. In assessing for primary levels, is it right to have a reflection by the learners? Um, when you assess, Okay, um, it's aligned with the learning competency. Try to check first if reflection is a requirement in the learning competency. Okay, if reflection is part of the learning competency, then assess the reflection. However, um, reflection is just something, reflection is something, is a process that the students go through when they look at your feedback because they need to reflect on your feedback the reflection process helps them think of ways on how they will address your feedback and revise their work so that's how the reflection is so therefore student goes on a process of reflection every time that they process your feedback so that's how reflection goes on Okay, so reflection is not necessarily getting a journal and putting in the reflection there. Another way on how you interject reflection is when you do a portfolio assessment. Every time that the student puts in an entry in the portfolio uh, assessment, the students can actually put in their reflections on about the things that they have learned from that particular revision process. Yeah. Okay, teacher Des. Thank you, sir. And then there's another uh, two questions, yes. Uh, the first one is, what are the challenges do you think our teachers would encounter via remote instruction? And then the second one, how do you think our teachers can improve their formative assessment practices? Okay, um, number one, um, challenges to think about Okay, in terms of encounter. Okay, when you do this one online, the challenges really is the internet connectivity. Sometimes it's not clear on what is being said. Sometimes your student could not um, get the announcement right away. And what we have seen in some of the pilot runs on flexible learning delivery online in some of the regions that we have conducted is that um, the attrition rates okay, is actually increased. If you have, for example, uh, an expected um, 20 students who will attend your online lesson, only about half attends or nine attends out of the 20. And it's really difficult to get the others come in. Okay, and um, how the announcement gets through um, despite um, texting them, despite sending them um, emails and monitoring them and sustaining them to attend diligently all of the lessons. So attrition rates, okay? So this is really the, the challenge. So therefore, we have to um, think of ways on how to um, maintain attendance, especially during the synchronous learning. Also, another is the attrition in terms of the submission of requirements. There are some students who could not um, cope up in submitting for the deadlines being set and sometimes difficult to look at the condition when the student why why the students are not able to submit and sometimes when the teacher starts calling uh, the learners making use of the mobile devices if there's no signal in the area then there is really difficulty in the communication so i think these are major challenges for um, remote learning especially when um, there's no signal or there's no poor internet connectivity in the area 
There are some students who do not have a stable internet connection that they only load data. That's why it's very important for the teachers that when they create um, tasks online, they need to count the megabits required to open that particular lesson. If the megabits required are counted, and this is informed to the learners ahead of time, then the learners would know the amount of data that they need to load in their devices. Okay, second question. How do you think are the teachers can improve their formative assessment um, practices? I think um, formative assessment practices will become more effective if the teacher is consistent in their communication with the students. And if the teacher is consistent in giving reminders to the student at least once a day, whether they are accomplishing the task and providing them reminders to accomplish the task or not. Yeah, if there's a way on how um, communication, consistent and regular communication is built with the learner, then formative assessment practices becomes actually um, effective. Yeah. Yeah, teacher Des. Thank you, sir. And now we have a question from Ivy Avelino via YouTube. How can we ensure that FA results are authentic to think that printed modules are answered at home with parents with attached answer keys? Okay. So um, for the formative assessment, it's okay for the parents to um, provide support um, to the learner when they do the assessment task. It's okay because it's still formative. And this can be clarified about... Initially, what should be the role of the parent when formative assessment is given and when summative assessment is actually provided? So we need to clarify how the parents need to distinguish their role when formative assessment and summative assessment are provided. It starts by the teacher telling the parent that for this particular exercise, this is formative. Okay, so you can provide your support. And for this particular task, this is summative, and these are some of the roles that you need to do. Okay, if formative assessment is being done, especially for the early grades, okay, for printed um, modules, okay, here are the roles of the parents. Number one, they can rephrase and restate the instruction. The parents can actually provide examples on how to do the task. The parents can um, teach the child how to accomplish the task. The parents can allow the child to redo the task if they have a wrong answer because anyway it's formative and the purpose of the formative is to help the child attain the learning competency so it's okay for the parents to do the following roles okay but the parent should not be the one to answer and there should be a realization in the parents part that it's okay for the child to make errors because when the child starts to make errors that's the point of entry on what needs to be taught to the child this needs to be clarified at the beginning of the school year now, if this is going to be a summative assessment, let's say you're doing a print module and uh, it's a performance-based task. Okay. Now, clarify now to the parent that they can reiterate the instruction, but they should not be the one to do the work. Okay. Now, um, if, if the teacher can create task in a way that it should be the learners and not the parents to do that particular task, then better. If the teachers can structure a way that the task is done outside of the home setting where the parents are not going to intervene um, better. For example, um, this can be done by the instruction for the summative assessment is only given to the child by the time that it needs to be done. For example, the performance-based task needs to be done for three minutes each child. Okay, so the instruction is given Friday and within the same day, the instruct that, that performance task needs to be demonstrated. Okay, so for example, the barangay captain is the one who's going to hand over the instruction or a parent representative who's going to do the instruction and then the parent representative will be the one to do the observation and the recording without the parent. Okay, and then that recording is sent to the teacher. So these are some of the ways on how you can actually... Um, ensure that the task is really done by the learner and not the parent. I'm, I have written an article on, on um, guidelines for parents in terms of the roles when assessment is formative or summative. I am going to um, give you the link now on where you can actually um, download that particular 
that particular article. Okay, I'm going to paste the link um, here in the, in the chat box so that, um, yeah, everybody can um, see it. Okay, and then uh, you can just share it in the Facebook and in YouTube. So it contains details on what the parents should do during formative and summative, during written and during performance, when there is a right and wrong answer and during performance task. Yeah, so it's there. You can read further. Okay. Okay, okay. sir, um, it's regarding again the parent involvement to the teaching and learning process. Um, the question of Mam Lucena B. Estrada, how about if parents won't accept more intervention materials to cope the unmastered competencies? What would won't it... accept? Yes. The parents don't like to accept that? Yes. The, the intervention materials. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Um, first and foremost, if the parents do not want to accept the intervention materials, meaning to say that they are rejecting learning. They are rejecting instruction. Okay, um, take note that um, the value of some intervention materials are provided to the child because you want to further support the child. And this needs to be explained to the parent. Sometimes our parent reacts in these ways because there are many things that are not clear to them. That's why there are some misconceptions that are building here. But if at the beginning of the school year during your parent um, orientations, if all of these strategies are laid down with them, if this is written in a paper in black and white and there's a contract with them, then these are solved and clarified. Yeah. Okay, thank you, sir. And there's also a PM to me uh, for those who are aspiring to do a research. Is a qualitative research on teachers' formative assessment practices via online instruction a good research to work on now that face-to-face -face yeah. classes are not yet allowed. Yeah, you can always do any kind of research that you want as long as it's clear and you have a good framework to begin with and you establish the gaps well. Yeah. Okay, okay so we can have our last question before last we go. Question. Do we have our last question, teachers, educators? Okay, Anyone? no more. No more? <laughs> Okay, okay we can end now, teacher uh, desk. Now, that is indeed a comprehensive and informative discussion on understanding formative assessment remotely, insights into Deaf Ed Order 31 series of 2020. Let us give a virtual round of applause to Dr. Carlo Magno. Thank you so much, sir. And I'm sure our participants have key takeaways from this session that are useful, practical, relevant, and applicable to their remote instruction particularly on the conduct of formative assessment. So that ends our webinar session for today. Thank you participants for joining us in today's webinar session. And we hope to have you online again for our upcoming webinars. Please don't forget to like and follow BSD Training Center's Facebook page and subscribe to Teachers Lib by BSD YouTube channel. Goodbye and see you soon again. Have a great week and thank you so much, Dr. Magno. Okay, bye-bye, bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye.